In today's video lecture, we are going to introduce the concepts of work and energy. These are the, some of the most important things that you will learn in this uh, semester of physics. Now, why do we care about work and energy? Well, energy is the ability to do work, and that allows you to do things like heat your house, make your car go, charge your cell phone, and so forth. When it comes to solving physics problems, understanding work and energy can make some really ugly problems easy. So if we do the work to understand a principle once, we can use that principle again and again. Work and energy are like a power tool when you're working your physics problems. They help you do things faster, more efficiently, better with less effort. Now, before we actually get into the details of how work and energy uh, help you do physics problems, let's just do a couple example problems to see the ugliness that energy can help us avoid. So here's one problem. Imagine we have a ramp and we have something sliding down the ramp. And we want to know what the velocity of the object will be when it gets to the bottom of the ramp. Well, my, if my ramp is just, you know, a, a constant slope, then I can write an equation that describes y as a function of x for my ramp. Um, and then what will the velocity be at any given y or any given value of x? Well, this is a constant acceleration problem, so the velocity is just the initial velocity plus a times t. But what is a? Well, if I define the angle that the ramp makes relative to the horizontal to be theta, then the acceleration, as we found before when we were studying uh, other topics, we found that on a ramp, the acceleration along the surface of the ramp is just g, the acceleration due to gravity, times sine of theta. So now my velocity is just v naught plus g sine of theta times t. If I just knew what t was, I would know what the velocity was. If I just knew the time it takes to get to the bottom of the ramp, this will tell me uh, what the velocity is at the bottom of the ramp. <clears throat> well, to find the, the time, I'm going to use my distance equation. So if we call the distance that the object slides as it goes down the ramp delta s, remember, our equations for constant acceleration tell us that delta s will just be v naught t plus one half g sine of theta times t squared, right? So it's v naught t plus one half the acceleration times t squared, and we decided that the acceleration is g sine of theta. All right? Well, notice uh, if I have a ramp and it drops a certain amount delta y, I can write delta s or delta y in terms of each other. Now, why would I want to do that? Why would I want to solve this problem using delta y instead of delta s? Or why would I not want to use delta x, for example? It turns out things are going to work really nicely when you use delta y. So we'll just go ahead and do that. So delta y, of course, the change in y, y goes down as we increase s, as we move along the ramp. So delta y is just negative delta s times sine of theta, right? The length of if I, if I draw a right triangle here with delta y, delta x, and delta s, y is the opposite side. So delta y is negative delta s sine theta. Great. Um, and then, of course, uh, delta s is just v naught t plus 1 half g sine theta t squared. So we plug that in for delta s. And now we have an equation for delta y. And we had an equation for velocity, right? And we said if I could use the the position equation to solve for time and plug that in to find the velocity. And that's how we've worked problems like these in the past. But today we're going to do something different. Okay? So instead of solving delta y, the delta y equation for time and plugging that in, I'm going to take the velocity and I'm going to square it. All right? So the velocity squared is just, right, I, I square both sides and I get this. And I'm going to define that to be equal to q. I'm just calling it some, made it, pulled Q out of the air, all right? Just because uh, in some of the things we're going to do in the next couple steps, it might be confusing to have that squared there. So V squared, I'm just going to define that to be equal to Q. Well, how does Q change as we go down the ramp? So when we go from the top of the ramp to the bottom of the ramp, the change in Q is just how this changes from time T equals zero to the final time, right? And at time t equals zero, it's just v naught squared. At the final time, it's this. And so when we subtract and take the difference, 
the v naught squared goes away. So that's how much q changes. That's how much velocity squared changes as we go down the ramp. Well, notice if I take this equation, I multiply both sides by one half, and then over here I'm going to pull out a factor of g sine theta, I get this. And what does this look like? Huh? Sine theta times this is just negative delta y. So one half delta q is equal to negative g times delta y. So, um, of course, what we found then was one half delta q is equal to negative g delta y. But delta q is the change in velocity squared. So we're going to put velocity back in now, but here's the thing we need to be careful of. The change in velocity squared is not the same as the change in velocity squared, right? So we're looking to see how velocity squared changes, not how velocity changes and then square that. All right, there's a difference. So delta q is the change in velocity squared. Okay, so looking at this equation and taking the g delta y to the other side, we're left with one half change in velocity squared plus g times change in y equals zero. All right, so as we change, as we go from the top of the ramp to the bottom of the ramp, these two things added together don't change. So that tells us that one half v squared plus g y must equal a constant. If their changes add to zero, then that means that when I add those two things together, I must get a constant. Now, if I multiply both sides by m, I get this equation here. So one half mv squared plus mgy is equal to a constant, and we'll call that constant e. Now, the reason we multiplied by m was because it turns out the things that we get here can be applied to other problems as well, and they're more useful in this form right here. So this is the equation we came up with then. So as the thing slides down the ramp, one half mv squared plus mgy is equal to a constant, and we're calling that constant e. <coughs> well, this term in front, one half mv squared, that is what we call the kinetic energy. The next term, mgy, is what we call the gravitational potential energy, and E is what we call the total energy. So basically, by letting this thing equal E and calling that energy, what we're taking advantage of is something called energy conservation. So the idea is we have these two things that contribute to the total energy, and then we say, ah, well, energy is conserved. How do we know that energy is conserved? Because when we came up with this equation, when we derived it for the thing sliding down the ramp, we found that this thing on the other side that we called E had to be a constant. All right, so that's a little peek into what we can do with energy, right? So now whenever I no, notice that the angle of the ramp never showed up. So I could have a ramp at any angle um, and this equation applies. So I never have to work the ramp again. If I want to find the, the velocity at the bottom, I can just use this equation. All right, so for example, if we let, if we define the top of the ramp to be y equals zero, and if we let the initial velocity of the object be zero, I can quickly solve this equation to find the velocity at the bottom. So one half mv squared is equal to negative mgy. I just move the mgy to the other side. If y is equal to zero and v is equal to zero, I plug those into this equation and I find that at the top, e is equal to zero and e doesn't change. That's our constant, right? So it'll m one half mv squared plus mgy will always equal zero for this problem because it started out as zero and it's a constant. So I just take the mgy to the other side, I cancel out the m's, multiply by two, then I take the square root and I find that the velocity at the bottom of the ramp is just equal to negative two gy. Well, negative y is how far we went down. Let's call that h. So our ramp, if I put a block on my ramp and it slides without friction, when it gets to the bottom of the ramp, the velocity is just the square root of 2gh, where h is the vertical change in distance, change in position. So how much it moved in x doesn't matter at all. So if I have a very, very long ramp and I raise one end up by one meter, and then the object has slides down a very gentle slope without friction, I get the same answer for the final velocity as if I had a very short ramp and I raised up one end so it was a meter high and the object went down at a very steep angle. Now, what happens if we're sliding down a more complicated curve, right? Something that's not just a flat ramp. 
Well, whatever that curve is, I'll just define y to be some function of x, right? And then what will the velocity be? V naught plus at? No, it won't be because this will not be a constant acceleration problem because the slope of this curve that we're sliding down changes, the acceleration is going to change as we change x. So what we can do is we can divide our curve up into an infinite number of infinitesimal steps. And we can say, well, the velocity is just the initial velocity plus a bunch of little changes in velocity that happen at each step. So each little change in velocity is just going to be the acceleration for that slice times the time that that slice lasts, the time that the object takes going past that slice, right? So if we zoom in on one of these slices, right, if I make my slices small enough, then the slope of the line for any slice will be a constant. And so then I can get the acceleration for that little piece of time. Well, if I measure the angle of the, well, if, if I give the angle of, the, uh, of that little slice, then acceleration is just g sine of theta. But of course, theta changes with x, which means theta changes with time. Um, but notice, the, if I have this little triangle here, and one side is negative how much y changes in that, di in that time step, dy. Down here, this line has a length which is equal to how much x changes in the time step, dt, and that's dx. So I know that the tangent of theta is just negative dy dx. So if I know y is a function of x, I know my curve, that's just the derivative of that curve. And so the acceleration then is just g times sine of the inverse tangent of negative dy dx, where dy dx, of course, is the derivative of the function that gives us y as a function of x for our curve. It turns out there's a trig identity where we can transform the arc tangent of the sine of an arc tangent into a thing with a square root and blah, blah, blah. We keep working through this. It's a big, ugly problem with an integral. But in the end, guess what? we end up with 1 half mv squared plus mgy equals a constant, e. All right, so this is why conservation of energy and understanding energy and work are so important for kinematic problems because oftentimes they can take really diff difficult problems and make them easy. So energy conservation is the power tool that can make some really ugly problems into very simple problems. Okay, now for the important stuff. We've motivated... You know, we've shown the kinds of problems that are hard to do without energy conservation that are easy to do with energy. So now let's talk about energy. So first of all, kinetic energy is the energy of motion. It's the energy that has to do with the fact that something is moving. The kinetic energy is just equal to one half mv squared. Now, it doesn't matter what direction the object's moving. That v there is just the magnitude of its velocity. Now, like all energies, it has units of joules in the SI system, and a joule is a newton times a meter, or a newton meter, uh, or a kilogram meter per second squared. And once again, it is a scalar. Kinetic energy is a scalar. Energy in general is a scalar. It doesn't matter which way the object's moving, it has a kinetic energy. It's just one half m magnitude of velocity squared. Okay, so that's energy. What's work? Well, the work energy theorem tells us that the net work on an object is just the change in kinetic energy. So work is what I do to something to change its kinetic energy. Now, if you apply a constant force in the direction of displacement, so I push on something in the direction it's moving with a constant force for a distance L, the work that I do is just force times distance. All right? And so these are two uh, relationships you should remember. So the net work on an object is equal to its change in kinetic energy, and work is force times distance. So here's an example. Imagine pushing a mass with a constant force on a frictionless surface. So F equals MA. If you're pushing with a constant force, that means constant acceleration. Constant acceleration means that V is just equal to V naught plus AT. Right, I square this to find v squared, and then if I multiply by one half m, I just get the kinetic energy. So the kinetic energy is equal to one half m uh, times all of this stuff, which can be simplified. Okay, so this is the kinetic energy. The change in kinetic energy I get by getting rid of v naught, getting rid of the constant term. Right. So here is my equation for the change in kinetic energy. Well, I know 
that my position, because it's a constant acceleration, my position changes according to my constant acceleration equation. Um, and of course, x minus x naught is just L, the distance the object moved. And uh, so I can just move L to the other side, and I've got a quadratic equation. I can solve for time using the quadratic formula. And then I know that acceleration times time then is just equal to this, what I got from the quadratic formula. So now I can take the equation we found for the change in kinetic energy and plug in our solution from the quadratic formula for AT. And you plug that in there, you square things out, multiply out the parentheses and cancel things. And without going through all the steps, you can show that everything cancels out except 2 times A times L. And then the 2 cancels out the 1 half. Uh, in front, and we're left with m times a times l, but mass times acceleration is force, so the change in kinetic energy in this case just turned out to be force times distance, right? And that's what our equation said. That's what I told you would be the case, that if we're pushing on something in the direction it's moving, the work we do is just the force times the distance. And we did an example, and we found that that actually worked. Now, what about in two or three dimensions? What if the direction I'm pushing is not the same as the direction that the thing is moving? Well, then work is just equal to the vector force dotted into the vector distance that uh, we moved. Note this is a scalar, right? A dot product returns a scalar. Energies are scalars. Now, if the force is not constant, then what we have to do is we have to break up time into little pieces, break up uh, our, our movement into little steps in distance, and then a little piece uh, over which each of those little steps, right, if we, if we take, make them small enough, take them uh, such that dr goes to zero, then the force over each little step in space will be a constant. And so a little bit of work is just force time dotted into a little change in position. And then we just integrate that to find work. So here, down here is the most general formula for work. Work is the integral of force dotted into an infinitesimal change in position. Now, of course, if force and displacement are in the same direction, the dot product just becomes magnitude of force times distance. And if the force is constant, it comes out of the integral, and we just get work equals force times distance, right? So here's the most general version, and you can derive the other ones from it. So I push on a block with a force. I do work, right, force times distance, and the energy, the kinetic energy changes because work is change in kinetic energy. But what if I have a block and I push it up? So I, I have a heavy thing in my hands and I lift it up a meter. Initially, it's not moving. At the end, it's not moving. Its kinetic energy didn't change. What about all the work I did, right? Force times distance. I did work lifting it up, but its kinetic energy didn't change. How is that? Or what if I take a spring and I push on the spring and it compresses, the spring compresses. I do work, force times distance, but the velocity of the spring doesn't change. Where did the energy go? Well, remember, the net work on an object is equal to its change in kinetic energy. When I lift an object upward, I do positive work on the object, but gravity does negative work, right? The force of gravity is in the opposite direction from the displacement, and it does negative work. When I push on a spring, the spring pushes back and does negative work. So the energy gets put into what we call potential energy, which we will discuss next time. But just for now, note that I can do work on something without changing its kinetic energy because something else might be doing negative work. So let's finish up with a bunch of examples. I push a block with a mass of two kilograms at a constant velocity up a frictionless ramp a distance of one meter. If the ramp makes an angle of 33 degrees with respect to the horizontal, how much work did I do on the block? Well, Work is force times distance, right? So what is the force? Well, if it's moving at a constant velocity, then the acceleration is zero. If the acceleration is zero, that means there's no force on the block. So one component of gravity is canceled out by the normal force. The other component is then just canceled out by me pushing. So the force of me pushing must just be equal to the component of gravity in the direction down the slope, which is mg sine theta. Well, work is just 
force times distance. So the work I do on the block is the force I push on times the distance. And of course, the force is mg sine theta. So the work I do is mg l sine theta. I plug in the numbers and I find the work I do is 10.7 joules. Yeah? Okay, how much work did gravity do on the block? Well, let's to break gra gravity up into its two components. And first we'll look at the component of gravity along the slope. We already know that that component is negative mg sine theta. So it's mg sine theta going down the slope. We are pushing up the slope. The object's moving up the slope. So it's in the opposite direction from the way that the block is moving. Well, the work of the Earth due to gravity on the block is just the force of the Earth on the block times the displacement, times the distance, which is negative MGL sine theta. I plug the numbers in, and I get negative 10.7 joules. So the work I did was positive 10.7 joules. The work that gravity, the Y component, sorry, the, the component of gravity along the slope did is equal and opposite to what I did. How about the component of gravity which is normal to the surface? Well, the force due to gravity, the component of gravity normal to the surface is negative mg cosine of theta, but it turns out we don't need to know what its magnitude is because work is equal to force dotted into distance. When the force is not in the direction of the displacement, we have to use the dot product version, and if the force is at 90 degrees to the direction the thing is moving, well, the, the dot product of two things at 90 degrees to each other is zero. So the, com the component of gravity normal to the slope, that is pointing in a direction which is orthogonal at 90 degrees to the direction that the cart, the, 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 uh, the block is moving. Therefore, that component of gravity does no work on the block. How much work did the ramp do on the block? Well, the ramp had no friction. All right, so the only force it exerted was the normal force. And of course, the normal force is just enough to cancel gravity pushing it into the slope. But once again, we don't need to know the magnitude of the normal slope force because the normal force is orthogonal to the direction of the displacement. So the normal force dotted into the displacement of the block will equal zero, and no work is done by the ramp. So what is the network done on the block? Well, the network done on the block is the work of me on the block plus the work of the Earth due to gravity on the block plus the work of the ramp on the block. The work that I did is MGL sine theta. The work that gravity did is negative MGL sine theta, and the work the ramp did was zero, so we add them up and we get zero. But we could have found the network without doing any of that just by noting the block is moving at a constant velocity. If it's moving at a constant velocity, its kinetic energy is not changing. And the network is equal to the change in kinetic energy. So the network is equal to the change in kinetic energy. And we know if the object's moving at a constant velocity, the change in kinetic energy is zero. Okay, let's do a similar problem. I push a block with a mass of two kilograms up a frictionless ramp a distance of one meter. If the ramp makes an angle of 33 degrees with respect to the horizontal, how much did the work did the block do on me? So this is the same problem, but now I'm not asking how much work did I do on the block, but how much work did the block do on me? Well, it's constant, it's, it's zero acceleration, constant velocity. So that means the force that I push on the block with must just cancel the component of gravity along the ramp, just like before. All right, but now what we want is we want the force of the block on me, not the force of me on the block. Well, Newton's third law says equal and opposite forces, right? If I push on the block with a force mg sine theta, the block pushes on me with a force of negative mg sine theta. So the work done by the block on me is the force of the block on me times distance, which is negative mg times L sine theta. So I plug in the numbers, and the work that the block did on me is just opposite the work that I did on the block. Okay, here's another problem. I push a block with a mass of two kilograms with just enough force to keep it sliding down a frictionless ramp at a constant velocity of 0.34 meters per second for a distance of one meter. If the ramp makes an angle of 33 degrees with respect to the horizontal, how much work did I do on the block? Okay, so once again, I'm pushing on the block. I'm trying to find the work that I do on the block. 
Um, but now the block is sliding down the ramp. So I'm pushing the block upwards just enough to cancel gravity such that the block doesn't accelerate. But now the block is moving in the opposite direction from the direction that I am pushing. All right? So once again, there's no acceleration, constant velocity. That means that the force I push on the block with is just the opposite of what gravity is, the component of gravity along the the surface of the ramp in the direction of the ramp. So it's the same force I'm pushing with as in the original problem. And so the work is just that force times L, which is MGL sine theta. But when I plug my numbers in, I have to remember, ah, the block, if, if I'm pushing in the positive direction, the block is moved in the negative direction and I have done negative work on the block. Does that make sense that I've done negative work on the block? Yeah, because gravity was trying to accelerate the block. Gravity is doing positive work on the block as it goes down, right? Gravity is pushing in the same direction the block is moving, but I am preventing the block from speeding up. So I'm pulling that energy back out that gravity is putting in. I'm doing negative work on the block this time. Okay, so a quick summary of today's lecture. There is a thing called energy, and it is conserved. And knowing that can make problems easier. Energy is a scalar has units of joules, which is equal to newton meters, or kilograms meters per meter squared per second squared. Now, one type of energy is kinetic energy, and kinetic energy is equal to one-half mv squared. And work is equal to the change in kinetic energy. The net work on an object is equal to the change in kinetic energy. The work done by any particular force on an object is just the integral of f dot dr if the force is in the same direction that the object moves, and if the force is constant uh, as it moves that distance, we can simplify that integral to just work equals F times L.